so very good evening and uh, namaste to all the panelists as well as the delegates i think this namaste has a special significance in this current times of covid which has taught the whole world that the culture which our country india bears is really very very strong and very very scientific so that none of the infection really passes from one person to the other we know that uh, this particular infection covid has really made a huge impact on the whole globe we just if we just talk about today's data across the globe we have more than 5.11 million cases and more than 3 lakh people have really deceased because of this disease in a very short span of hardly 3 to 4 months also when it comes to india we are not sailing in a different boat we are also almost following the globe we see there are this is just today's data we look you see can 126 One lakh and twenty-six thousand people are suffering from uh, COVID, and uh, we have also lost lives of more than three thousand and seven hundred patients as of today. Definitely, in this these current times, we are not aware about what can be the management. What is the is there any scope for vaccination? What are the treatment options? Nothing we are aware about. But currently, what can can be a possible thing is just social distancing and absolute isolation. We agree that a lot many jobs can be done. by isolation by working from home but when it comes to some specific jobs like the job of a medical uh, doctor or when it comes to healthcare worker or a surgeon it is definitely impossible to work from a social distancing thing you have to be with the patient if you want to care them so we would like to really salute all the healthcare workers for your dedication for your selfless support to the human kind to fight against covid as well as to fight against other infections and other diseases which the people really need our help and to save their lives uh, without taking too much of time i would uh, straight away uh, move to uh, dr zishan hamid and request him to please take the sessions further thank you thank you amit good evening everyone i am dr bm zishan hamid associate professor from kmc manipal india on behalf of itru which is international training and research in uro oncology and endo urology i would like to welcome our esteemed panelists from different regions of the globe and also the viewers and participants who have taken time out to attend yet another webinar with the advent and expansion of technology the world is becoming a smaller place the evolution of newer means of connectivity has definitely made us achieve something we could not even have imagined a few years back internet and social media has indeed opened horizons such as real time meetings on a common platform and teaching online the global population as you see is around 7.8 billion and almost 60% have mobile phones and half of the population are active on social media A study published recently in March or in in May showed, on an average, six hours of screen time was used after COVID. Today we are here to discuss about one of the most powerful and influential tools of communication, which is social media and social networking in the medical field. A study showed Facebook being the most common platform in use, with approximately two thousand four hundred forty nine million users, followed by YouTube and WhatsApp. among doctors and other professionals twitter is gaining popularity with 340 million users now may i take this opportunity to introduce our speakers for today's webinar dr dripak raguri is an active member of the you group which is youth organization of urology society of india his interests include endourology and has done lot of work in stone disease and flexible ureteroscopy Dr Raguri is a fantastic organizer of international conferences and online webinars. Dr Raguri will be enlightening us about the use of Twitter for urologists. Dr Jeremy Tio, he has spearheaded the Eurosomi movement on Twitter. Majority of the hashtags in Twitter discussing urology will include either Jeremy or Eurosomi. His field of interest include bladder cancer and prostate cancer. he will be taking us on advanced twitter right and he will be telling us about twitter analyticals dr aditya prakash sharma is one of the budding urologists of indian urology and he is very active in clinical research with numerous publications 
His interests include stone disease and uro-oncology. A very humble urologist who is definitely going to be one of the most prominent face of Indian urology in future. Dr. Sharma will touch on the delicate topic of relationship between WhatsApp and patients. This man has almost 500 odd publications and needs no introduction. He is the president of Petra Group, iTrue Group, and he also heads the Europe hands-on training program for the international residents. He is also an active member of European School of Urology, European School of Eurotechnology. He also serves in the editorial board of most of the urology journals. Words are less to speak about this multi-talented endourologist. Professor Somani will speak on the use of telemedicine. The ever-charming Vinit Gauhar made a niche in the digital media and social platform by organizing numerous webinars. He is an avid teacher and fantastic orator. He is a well-known figure among the network of global urologists. Dr. Gauhar will share his views on the use of webinars. At last, I would like to say that we'll be taking a lot of questions during the webinar. You can type your questions in the box on your StreamGo screen with your name and the speaker you would want to direct it to. We will stick on to the time and try to answer as many questions as we can. Thank you very much. And now I direct it to Dr. Deepak Raghuri to start the first talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jason, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, my job today is to uh, speak about Twitterati. When he says urologist as Twitterati, there are two ways of looking at it. The ones who are already pros in using Twitter and the ones who are actually getting to know about Twitter. So I'll, I'll focus on both the aspects with some brief introduction about uh, Twitter and about digital media leading to Twitter as to one of the most common platforms for doctors and urologists, and then the pros and cons. So if you have to brush through the introduction of Twitter in a, in a, in a single slide, it's an American microblogging and a social networking site, which came into vogue in 2006. And the messages we post are called tweets, like we all of us know, and started by Jack Dorsey, Noah Glass, Biz Stone, and Ian Williams, a group of friends who came out with this fantastic platform. To start with, it had only 140 characters and slowly increased to 280 characters now. And I, I, you will know the relevance as to how important these characters are to keep our messages crisp and, and clear. And there are over 330 million users and it's increasing by the day and 340 million tweets a day. And it's a $4.4 billion company and I'm sure it's growing by the day itself. And if you have to introduce uh, uh, the Twitter platform. It's nothing but sharing information with anyone who has an account on Twitter. So it's an open platform, basically. If you can get in touch with or get an ID of one of the uh, handlers of Twitter, you can directly message to them. It's been traditionally used by uh, politicians, celebrities, and sports persons, predominantly the public figures, to get in touch with millions or thousands of fans across. So it becomes a common platform and an easier way to communicate. And transparency and accessibility of information on these platforms become very critical. That's important, actually. And the most popular form of social media used by doctors or the healthcare community is Twitter. If you remember the slide, actually, Dr. Jishan flashed in the starting. The Twitter is actually in the last three of the most popular social media platforms. But it is the most popular amongst doctors for obvious reasons. You'll get to know why. And there are conflicting opinions about physicians using social media as well. We will discuss as we go by. And to your right, you see a lot of numbers there, uh, which I've already highlighted. The most important being over 100,000 healthcare professionals who are actually using Twitter. Before we come to Twitter as a social media platform, which is the most common in healthcare professionals, let us see where it all began with. The digital medicine began in early 2000s. And the cable television and internet actually revolutionized the whole thing. And the two most popular things globally, who people can relate to about health shows, are the Dr. Oz show and Sanjay Gupta show on CNN. And enormous following and accessibility for the public towards a medical professional on a TV made this an instant hit. But in the uh, process of having the glitz and glamour on the screen, there is a compromise on the credibility of the content that was going. And to, if you look back, 46% of the content which used to come on the TV was only factual. 
the rest was all for the purpose of show and the credibility and rapport with his followers actually grew by day by day is purely because he used to say that there is something which he can do miraculously no matter what your disease is i can do this something like a miracle pill and people blindly followed it whereas sanjay gupta who was a neurosurgeon by profession he strove to maintain the accuracy he was very ethical he wanted to tell the facts that are there on the books or no sensationalization basically but his viewership was very limited now you see how the tv works actually the more sensationalism and the more glitz and glamour people tend to follow you better but that didn't work out for all the doctors isn't it and it used to be difficult for all the doctors to reach the tv platform and misinformation plagues the digital medicine and unrealistic expectations creep by and the inability to maintain the correct information and sustain viewership became a huge challenge as far as tv is concerned but then the digital medicine in the age of television and uh, and of course uh, uh, the early internet introduced a dilemma of balancing accuracy and popularity medicine made much more accessible uh, and the change of perception amongst the people who were actually trying to reach the healthcare professionals also changed reduced the imbalance between healthcare provider and the patient these are the few things that actually happened because of the uh, digital media sorry so stuck okay so now let's come to the benefits of uh, twitter if you look at the tv what's the major thing that happens it allows many users to tune in but it's not interactive and there are very few sources or channels or programs where an individual can get to know about a doctor but what what happens with twitter many people can actually contribute to the discourse and you can actually opine and there are many sources to reach to and it is actually a conversation that happens you can directly reply and tweet or an endorse and any medical expert can share his views on twitter and it allows to reach a very broad audience especially for us a fellow physicians a trainees and the patients of course at times and can access public interest in topics and create hashtags which would create a, a sense of discussion and a debate which can go on in twitter as far as we are concerned research takes seems to be taking the place uh, the, uh, at the forefront sharing and advance of medical research biomedical research is of utmost importance for us as we all know and that seems to be really helping with the twitter platform and you will be able to connect to the researchers and the physicians in 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 the very first place a direct connect can happen which never used to happen before and sharing of new treatments clinical problems and interesting case studies can all be discussed on on twitter platform and it reduces the barriers of collaboration a two way communication between the source and the consumer is what happens i'll take it through different aspects of a twitter and how every individual is trying to use it there are group let us talk about researchers and clinicians and there are few examples which i have put up on the screen now there are doctors who would love to explain about techniques about various instruments or what are the settings you use in laser machines versus there is no end to it and there are there are doctors who would like to review the new latest technology in the market and some would like to uh, see how they actually felt when they use these instruments so this is the first and information and when it comes to uh, the information comes to you from a colleague of yours who's extremely experienced and is a senior most one then obviously has an ex, uh, a very high value and as far as articles and publications are concerned and twitter has literally become a vetting area for publications isn't it you get, tend to get in touch with the publisher themselves you tend to comment about his publication or ask questions or maybe debate on a few aspects of a paper and the author himself will respond to you that's which is fantastic actually and the critical commentary and opinions takes place throughout day in and out and the journals themselves and there are so many journals these days i'm sure it's not possible for all of us to have access to all these journals and these journals are also there on twitter which are actually giving day to day updates about their new articles about uh, just about a latest article you might not get the article as a as a, a total entity but yes you would at least be updated about what's happening and as far as public health is concerned which is of Uh, a, a paramount importance in a country like us and you can see how uh, the ministry of health twitter handle is doing fantastically well what it does it is got an ability to connect to millions of people around it can pass on a message in no time the people who are involved in such activities are pulled together very easily and the information is very easily shared amongst us and in co- conditions like the recent covid or even in a typhoon that has recently struck us all these relief efforts are wonderfully conducted even on twitter you get uh, people with uh, importance in such scenario to react very fast 
and of course the conference updates these days it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in a conference hall or not you're still getting the updates at a real time almost so you're sitting in one conference and getting to know about another conference which is happening in another corner of the world so that's how fast the information passed through twitter in forms of images in forms of content in form, i mean uh, uh, videos or comments you name it it can all happen there and of course all the organizations around the world these days keep in touch with their uh, followers or members in form of a twitter account so you get day to day updates from all the organizations and of course what's urology without gadgets isn't it our instruments our gadgets are gadgets are such importance to us and we we are always associated with our industry partners and you can actually follow them and they always put up updates on what's coming up next what is the review of a particular instrument that has been recently released in the market and experiences of urologists who have been using these instruments so you get an uh, an empty number of uh, tweets about the uh, instead of you calling up your colleagues and asking about their experience about an instrument you would get them straight away here on twitter and of course a lot of doctors like to uh, put up cases and of course also surveys you see a lot of surveys happening on twitter to know about it could be about urology perspective it could be about anything else there are a lot of surveys that happen you can do a survey also on uh, twitter but the diversity and the collaboration that happens on twitter is is fantastic and exchange of information is extremely beneficial amongst the experts and of course even amongst the viewers and sharing of information it can be communicative and a collaborative atmosphere that can develop and it it increases the quality of care if you learn day by day you improve your quality of uh, service to the patient as well and and of course like all social media twitter also carries its own set of risks let us go through them uh, one by one the major assumption in twitter is all information is accurate which is not twitter itself says that the misinformation quotient is as high as 20% so you should know where to look whom to follow what to read about and no, there is no unfortunately no systemic process that can check misinformation so that headache lies on you you should know where to look for and what you trust and it, twitter primarily relies on crowd sourcing and voluntary experts so these so called voluntary experts are the ones who who declare themselves as experts on whatever field they are so you, you there is no way you can cross check that the so called non experts or incorrectly informed people are the ones who have some commercial interest they have a easy go at twitter those are the ones who confuse you so you should know which is a credible one and which is not and the worst case scenario are the anonymous and the unmarked accounts they create havoc tweets are brief and the key info is often omitted like i said 280 characters seems lot but it is not trust me when you are actually trying to express something you tend to write in long sentences so it's an art to tweet it should be so short sweet and at give a correct information problems for patients and students is to find a credible source amongst the sea of these things and i'll give you an example how a celebrity can actually create a havoc when they try to comment on healthcare related issues jim carrey like we all know is a big time hollywood uh, actor tends to come out on to twitter and say that why are we giving vaccines to kids for measles it's nothing but poisoning them it's full of mercury and aluminum doesn't know where the, i mean we really don't know where the source of information comes in but he is actually jolly well gone on ahead and put it on twitter what happens there's utter chaos with the people who actually follow him and they trust him isn't it so there eventually was such a big uh, hue and cry across america that they actually didn't want to take the vaccine and it eventually led to a break a outbreak of measles in 2015 so in a way the twitter becomes an echo chamber of ideas what do you mean by the echo chamber of ideas it's a shared opinion rather than a balanced fact so whatever you believe in you feel it is right you tend to share it and that doesn't mean it is right always and there is a high volume of misinformation on twitter it's impossible to filter it and every hashtag is commented by both professionals and so called non experts also the impact it impacts the accurate uh, expert opinion because the volume is so high and the, when the accuracy is challenged the conclusion and the solutions go unnoticed so that's the uh, the flip side of twitter the pure share volume of it and the more information is not necessarily better remember it's not always right and twitter itself says that 40% of it is pointless babble that's exact words they use pointless babble so you straight away there is 40% gone and 37% is closely conversational so you you get you see that's that's the margin of error we have to pick up the right content we need and it gives a enough scope for unprofessional behavior people take advantage of this there's a lot of profanity there is a lot of much slinging so they tend to use the platform to to abuse somebody or scold somebody you see it day in and out mostly with politicians or celebrities 
there's a high rate of unprofessionalism and violation of pri patient privacy is one thing which we should be very careful about and which can easily slip out of our fingers. And the conflicts of interest is one of the most concerning things for us. It's the Twitter's very nature and the user's in the experience, a combination of these two things which actually puts us in trouble. And let us see a disadvantage from the physician's aspect of it. It's 80% of the tweets from the physicians come between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Perfect, that's the time we are supposed to work, but at times we're busy tweeting, isn't it? So it takes away the potentially valuable doctor time which is supposed to be catered to a patient. And the physician resistance to using Twitter is primarily if there's a lack of a return of investment, if you would like to say that, because you use much time on it, it doesn't come back straight away to you in terms of returns. And there are enough uh, social uh, media suggestions coming from various uh, organizations that you are not supposed to use in the hospital premises purely because the quality of time that you give to the patients is compromised. And the current users of Twitter, like I've already highlighted, over 2,000 healthcare providers tweet more than once a day. So there's a lot of information that is coming in. There's a lot of role to play in research and new technology that is coming up. The less experienced, when I said, are the ones who tend to use patient interactions to be posted on Twitter, the X-ray images, cropped images. So try and avoid those things. Be very sure about the, uh, the privacy issues when you do that. And uh, more than 5% of the tweets violates patients' privacy. That's the amount of uh, issues that we are having. And the excellent in connecting experts with physicians by sharing information. Physicians have access to clinical trials and updates. The impact of quality of care to the patient is, 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 is improving by the day. And the medical research is a multi-tired approach. Sentiment analysis, data mining, and artificial intelligence are, are I think, uh, Jeremy will be speaking up next as to how well you can actually analyze the data that you have. And the predictive power with Twitter is amazing. You can track the infectious diseases or natural disasters or the drug abuse which is happening. So there are various other means how Twitter can be used. Many doctors are doing fine, but a lot of them know much less. So if I have to give you take home messages, it, has, it is an art and a skill to do a, a messaging on Twitter. So it, it's, it has to be acquired. There are some clear guidelines for physicians as to how it is to be used. And please maintain your personal and professional accounts separately or try and keep the distance between these two. Avoid profanity, avoid promoting any products or medications, don't endorse anything that wouldn't do good to your profile and state clearly about your affiliations and conflicts of interest. Always combat misinformation. Somehow I am very uh, for this point because we being doctors and responsible citizens should make sure that something which is not right medically is going around in Twitter we should put our foot down and say, no, this is not right. So that becomes our responsibility. And one last thing, always read, reread your tweet before you post. Don't miss on that. Implementing any education program, which is better than the current lack of education is a step in the right direction, but it's only a start. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Nice talk. Now, can we have uh, Jeremy Teo speak about advanced Twitter? Okay, thank you very much for the um, invitation. My great pleasure to share about my experience in Twitter analytics. Uh, I'm trying to share my PowerPoint. You should be able to see it now. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, in this talk, I'm going to go through some basic stuff um, in Twitter analytics followed by some more complex stuff and how we can use it to analyze, uh, to interact, to have some results that might impact on the way we use Twitter. And I will also um, show you an example of how we can utilize the Twitter platform to conduct research work in the urology field. So social media analytics is the practice of gathering and analyzing data from social media platform. And there are many, many different softwares that we can use. The easiest one will be Twitter analytics. Um, if you want to look into other types of social media, there are different analytics like the Google analytics. There are more complex softwares, for example, Node XL. Uh, basically these softwares can extract really API data from the social media platforms. Um, somewhat like a big data type of data set where you can have some uh, in-depth analyses depending on the question they want to answer. 
And um, in fact, if you want to know about the basics in social uh, media analytics, we have published one paper in European Urology Focus, and I think it might be useful for a urologist. Um, there are some very common measures that we will, that we're, I'm sure everybody has heard about. For example, impression, reach, and engagement. What do they really mean? So to, to a certain extent, it quantifies how successful a particular activity is from a social media perspective. Impression basically means how many times a certain content appears in your uh, smartphone or on your computer. Reach refers to the number of individuals that you actually um, uh, able to get in touch with um, through the social media platform. And the third one, which I think is most important, is engagement. It's really how many times an individual actually interacted with your, uh, with your activity. For example, whether, whether that person has liked your tweet, has replied on your tweet, has retweeted your tweet, or any form of engagement, which means that they probably have really read about your tweet, have some thought about it, which we think is probably reflective of how successful your, your tweet is. And this is just an example of Twitter analytics. Um, everybody can look into their own Twitter account and see how many impressions you have reached, how many engagement, how many reach you have reached. And these are some very basic uh, analytical results that you may want to refer to. And you, with more experiences, you know what kind of tweets will be able to yield more engagement. And you can, it's some kind of feedback where you can try to fine tune your future tweets in the future. Um, there are some other more complicated uh, analytics. And this is just one of the example. Um, um, this is example using Node Excel. Basically, um, it collects all raw data uh, from the Twitter platform. Uh, not only about reach impression, but they actually look into the um, engagement different uh, among between different individuals, the types of engagement between different individuals, and they try to work out the the network between individuals. So it's more or less like a spatial representation of the Twitter users involved um, um, on a certain topic. And you can even try to categorize the different uses into different networks. So in this example, um, we use the term Eurosomi, and we found that there are more than a thousand Twitter users, and we're able to categorize them into eight groups. So eight groups of eight groups of people discussing stuff about Eurosomi. And um, in fact, um, um, in each group, we'll be able to identify so-called more important people or key opinion leaders in different groups uh, as measured by a term called centrality. In fact, um, I think these terms are quite complicated, but in, in essence, in brief, um, uh, Egan factor centrality means how powerful that person is. Between a centrality refers to how much connection um, that person has in terms of middlemen. So, so how many bridges um, that he has with other friends. Closeness centrality is meaning how intimate their relationship is. So there are different ways to identify key opinion leaders uh, in social media platforms. And to a certain extent, if you're able to engage these leaders, then hopefully your tweets or your activity will be more successful. So I want to show you some examples of how we can use it uh, to understand stuff. And uh, the first example is what I did uh, with Stacy um, using the, the data set around the EAU meeting in 2019. So basically, we tried to use hashtags EAU19 and EAU2019 we gather all the tweets that contain these hashtags, and then we try to work out what are the components that constitutes a successful tweet in urology. And in fact, if you really draw the data, the API data from, from Twitter, you'll be amazed by how many parameters we can draw from it. And it's really like some kind of big data analysis. It involves a lot 
well, not a lot, but some degree of um, um, programming where you can try to identify outcomes like the number of likes, number of tweets. We can look into the parameters, including word count, number of mentions, hashtags, uh, Twitter user related parameters, etc. And then you can even run analyses on it. So we, we, we look into the outcome of number of likes and number of retweets, and then we're able to work out a number of messages. For example, um, the first thing which I think is very important for a successful tweet is that you should really try to utilize the, the number of words or number of characters that's allowed in each tweet. So don't be afraid to write longer tweets. In, in general, the more informative the tweet is, the more engagement you can yield from the audience. And we realize that if you try to mention more people, then your friends generally will try to respond to your tweets. But then um, out of our expectation, if you use a lot of hashtags, if your tweet is full of hashtags, it's actually quite annoying and people don't really like it. And uh, always try to attach a photo with your tweet because they are visually attractive. If it's just words, it's boring and people don't like it. If you really tweet, many, many times a day, people generally will get irritated and doesn't want to, people do not want to read about your tweets. And um, if you have more engagement with other people, for example, you like other people's tweets, uh, people generally respond back to your tweets. And uh, interestingly, time since joining Twitter has no effect on the engagement that you can use with your tweets. So it's never too late uh, to start using Twitter. And among the different uh, measurements of centrality, uh, between the centrality is actually the best. So we can work out some messages based on so-called advanced um, Twitter analytics. But I wish to, to state an example that we have done recently. Um, in this project, um, it, does, it didn't involve complex analytics. In fact, uh, it just used Twitter as a platform to engage more people that to get involved in this project. And um, as everybody is affected by COVID-19, of course, there are many you know, bad things about COVID-19, but one of the good things is actually it enhances the use of social media, like webinars, like what we're doing now, which is fantastic. And um, um, I decided to use the, so the Twitter platform to disseminate a survey about the impact of COVID-19 on urological services. And um, basically, it all, it all started by a tweet, started with a tweet um, on the 30th of March. And um, the responses is, is really overwhelming. We're able to have more than a thousand respondents it's just in just nine days' time. And just to let you know um, what's happening during that period. So uh, from the 30th of March to the 7th of April, nine days time, we got 1,000 responses. But you can also see that during that time, it's actually during the surge of COVID-19. So it was about 800,000 when we begin the survey. But when we concluded the survey, it already reached 1.4 million. So it's really during a surge of COVID-19 when we conduct this survey. And um, in this survey, what we re really want to know is about the degree of reduction in urologic surfaces. How did COVID really affect your surface? But we want to get something more from it. So we try to stratify by the geographical location because we know where the respondent come from. We try to stratify by the degree of outbreak because we have the date when the survey respondent actually completed the survey and we actually match with the WHO data at that particular date, how many new case, how many cases of COVID-19 were there in that individual's country. And so we're able to work out how the degree of outbreak impact on the reduction in urological surfaces. And then we try to stratify by the nature and urgency of urological conditions. For example, uh, will benign conditions be more affected by the malignant conditions, et cetera. And so we also look into some more subjective stuff, something that may not be easy to quantify, which I think is quite interesting. So globally, 
what we found is that 27% of the respondents said there were manpower shortage problem. 26% has to be deployed either in a voluntary or mandatory basis. About half of the respondents were fearful going to work. So COVID-19 is very stressful. And one third of them felt that they had adequate PPE, which is quite disappointing. So <laughs> two thirds felt that they are not well protected. And then very, very, um, it's very unfortunate that 13% of the healthcare workers were actually advised not to wear masks because of fear of scaring a patient. So um, it's something that we, we shouldn't be, we should be very upset about. And 21% were advised not to have media or social media exposure or contacts. So don't speak about COVID in front of the media. And then to make it worse, despite all the hard work, despite the risk of infection, of course, 60% expected pay cut. And um, about half of the, of the people are worried that the postponement of services would actually affect the treatment outcomes as well as the survival outcomes for malignant uh, conditions. So I think these are really interesting points that we can derive from the survey. And the next thing is about the primary outcome certified by different factors. So when we have so much data globally, we actually can work out the global map about the reduction of services. In terms of clinics, in terms of urologic investigations, for example, biopsies, cystoscopy, et cetera, and in terms of surgery as well. So this is just a global map reflecting reduction of services in terms of clinics. So um, the least affected ones will be in a a, a lighter blue color. Those most affected ones will be in dark blue color. So we can see that actually most countries are affected in particular um, and some parts of Europe, some parts of uh, uh, South America, uh, Russia, etc. And in Africa, China, these are le less affected. And we have similar data in the other aspects uh, such as investigations as well as, as surgery. The next thing, it's more complicated. Just now we talked about stratifying the results by the degree of outbreak. So in the y-axis is actually um, the degree of cut down surfaces based on the respondent's um, uh, answers. But we also stratify um, the degree of outbreak by percentile. So for each row, for each, pay, uh, for each cut down percentage, we have five more percentiles from, from the 20th, 40th, 60th, 80th to 100th percentile. So basically, if you look into the top here, no cuts, those with the lowest degree of outbreak will, have, uh, will be least affected here. But then gradually, you can see there's an increase of cut down of services when there is increasing degree of outbreak. So this kind of proves the, 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 the hypothesis that the more outbreak it is, then the more cut down you expect. And it is true for all, all aspects from clinics to investigation to surgery. And surgery seems to be most affected. And then we also try to stratify by the nature and urgency of the conditions. So again, benign ones, non-urgent ones, in light blue color, malignant disease in dark blue color. So obviously, uh, benign ones are really very affected, um, like those BPH or uh, urine incontinence, renal stone, blastone. Uh, malignant conditions are least affected. And some so-called benign, but potentially urgent stuff, for example, your track stone or transplants, they are uh, luckily less effective as well. So, so by, by this data, we know the, about the pattern of, um, of the reduction of services based on the condition itself. So in fact, um, all the results uh, were actually just published today at uh, European Urology. So if you are interested to look into it, feel free to click into the website, click into it. There's already an early preprint where you can find it in the website. So in summary, I think Twitter is an excellent platform for healthcare professionals. I think Dr. Deepak has already had a very comprehensive review on that. And I feel that feel I share with, with his uh, opinion uh, totally. 
and uh, social media analytics is a practice of gathering and an analyzing data from social media platforms. A number of tools are available that they are very easy to use. It can certainly help us understand more about our audience and how we can improve further. It can also, it is also a good platform for us to conduct research work. Well, of course, it depends on the nature of research work, but generally simple ones. Um, it is a good platform to gather more people to, to get on board to your research work and start using Twitter if you haven't. Um, and of course, I strongly encourage you to practice social media in analytics in order to maximize your engagement with your targeted audience. So this, uh, with this, I would like to end my talk. So thank you once again. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Excellent talk and congratulations on your new paper. Now we move on to, I'm audible. Now we move on to Dr. Aditya Prakash Sharma. Thank you so much, Zishan. Uh, I'll be sharing my slides now. I hope they are visible now. Yeah. Uh, Congratulations, Jeremy, for that wonderful talk and the publications. Uh, I'll straight away jump to my topic, which is patients in WhatsApp, the perks and pits of technology. And uh, uh, I have no disclaimers. I have no relation whatsoever to the owners of WhatsApp. So I'm not advocating use of WhatsApp uh, in this one. Why I'm here? I'm here because of this publication. This was uh, way back last year in April, June, this time. Uh, we analyzed few... Uh, uh, publications already working around WhatsApp and uh, summarize those and pu publish in the Indian Journal of Urology. If you look at the communication timeline, uh, my erstwhile teachers used to tell them that the consultation when they used to write during the institutional uh, protocols, they used to get in written. And we also have written during our AIMS days, uh, writing consultation and getting those uh, pulpit. Then came the era of uh, dial-up phones followed by pagers. And now what you have is a smartphone. At a click of a single button, you have a communication and there is no communication gap uh, practically whatsoever between you and the other person you want to talk to. This has influenced our clinical practice and so much so, uh, I'll be just explaining how I am using it. It is not different uh, from other clinicians who are using it. We have basically groups which can be formed and we have a uro-oncology group at PGI which, uh, in which uh, our very own uh, next door uh, oncologist is sharing latest information about the oncology, which can improve the patient care. We have a uropathology group in which we can discuss the uh, anything out of the box we are getting. And about one in five, we are able to change the management protocol. We have our uroradiology group. We have zonal conferences, zonal groups in which we are discussing anything under the roof, right from the conference uh, intakes and uh, the right from whatever the incision and the nuances of the incision itself, whether you are able to uh, convert it to, uh, away from the umbilicus or right bang onto the umbilicus. So these are the things which has come up due to the use of WhatsApp. And uh, the timeline has been quite rapid for the development of WhatsApp. If you look at it, in 2018, this was the report that telephonic consultation amounts to culpable negligence, which will attract IPC 304. So IPC 304 is almost like culpable homicide, uh, culpable uh, negligence not uh, amounting to homicide. And this was in 2019 that the government realized that telephonic medical consultation cannot be criminalized and COVID changed it completely. Use of WhatsApp for routine consultation by docs was what was advocated. And so much so that it is now in vogue uh, legally now that uh, telemedicine practice guidelines uh, uh, have uh, taken note of it and WhatsApp, Facebook messengers, Google Hangouts are not being included as... as as Aditya, there's some audio issues. Is the uh, frame is frozen, Zishan. Uh, 
Mr. Shubhadeep, can you just check? There's some audio issues. Sir, I'm already speaking to my technical team. Okay, okay. Is there any network issue with Aditya? Otherwise, we can swap the order uh, position if... Uh... Yeah, I think uh, we'll start with Dr. Bhaskar Somani. Is that okay? So, yeah, we should. Yeah. May I invite uh, Dr. Bhaskar Somani from UK, who's going to speak on telemedicine. After his talk, we can continue with uh, Aditya Prakash's talk. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hello, friends. Uh, thank you, Zishan. Uh, and telemedicine, we have heard a lot about social media. And that uh, brings us uh, close to telemedicine because we use various forms of social media for it. And I think it's going to stay and COVID is only going to make it uh, uh, much more common than what we've seen before. So first of all, these are my affiliations and I'm thankful to Zishan and uh, a member of iTrue. Uh, and uh, it's really great to have all your friends on board. This is uh, telemedicine and neurology. If you look at it, it started in 1993. And currently, uh, you know, over the last uh, 27 years, it's had 211 hits. If you look at telemedicine and neurology on PubMed. Now, obviously the first paper was in 1993 and that was around the, the army trying to do telephone or some sort of video consultations. And of other specialties, urology was one of them. If you look at telemedicine and COVID, however, and we know that COVID has only been there for the last uh, few months, it's got already got 316 hits, which means with COVID, telemedicine is going to increase in all spheres of uh, medical, uh, you know, subspecialities, urology being one of them. So just to take a closer look of what is actually telemedicine, it is healing at a distance. So you're not physically there, it's healing at a distance, but there are more than 107 definitions. So let's look at a common definition, which is given by WHO, and that's delivery of healthcare using information and communication for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases and injuries, research, and for education. This is practically what we all do as doctors. So that definition is just healing at a distance, but actual the way we do it or our role doesn't really change. So there are a few elements of telemedicine, which is providing clinical support, connecting users that are not in the same location, using various types of information and communication technology. And finally, the goal is to improve health outcomes. Now, the common medical usage in clinics at the moment, uh, if you look at how we are going to use it, that is using video, voice, audio, text, and there is an element of digital data exchange. And that could be in form of audio, video, text, different timings, and uh, you know, it is used for consultations of various types. It could be telephone consultation, it could be prescribing medicines, it could be for telesurgery. Commonly before COVID or in the last few years, it has been mainly been used by teleradiology, pathology, dermatology, and cardiology. And cardiologists have been using it for a lot long for monitoring patients. So if we come to teleconsultation, we have some benefits. You know, you expand and you can reach remote areas which you couldn't reach otherwise. It's convenient, it's accessible. You can do it from your drawing room and so can the patients. There is a more patient engagement. However, you do need technical training and equipment. And I think this is where most people haven't been trained who use telemedicine. There is a decreased inpatient interaction. So you're not there, you can't physically examine the patients and there could be issues with patient safety and confidentiality. And you have to make sure these are addressed before you can do telemedicine. So there are some tips to telemedicine. So I'll give you an example of how I would do it if somebody was to, you know, if I was to call a patient. So let's say I'm talking to Mrs. Samani. So I ring the patient or ring Mrs. Samani. Hello, Mrs. Samani. This is Professor Samani from the hospital. Uh, have I got the right person? She will say yes or no. Before we continue, can I please check your date of birth or some other identity or password that you might have given to them 
Once they confirm that, then only you begin. So you set the scene, which means checking patient identity. Once you have done that, you have to be punctual. You give them a time slot. Don't say 10.30. It may not be 10.30. You know, give them a time slot. So I will call you between or in the email, you will be called between this and this time slot. And then set an agenda. When you call, once you've confirmed, you set an agenda, you know, so I'm calling regarding whatever, or what do you think the call is going to be? And check with the patient that that is the right agenda. They might have three appointments they're waiting for. So make sure you're, you know exactly what they are expecting and is that what you're going to deliver? Tell the charisma. I mean, even though it's telemedicine, you should still be appropriately dressed. If it's a video conference, if you're normally going to shave, you should, you know, you should still be appropriately, except it's at a distance. You still need to follow what you would normally do. Postures, gestures, etc. Use of words. I mean, if you're going to talk to them and say, I'm going to take some notes, so I'll be typing in between. That's fine. If you suddenly start typing, the patient doesn't know. They don't know if you're going to check your email. They don't know if you're doing something else, responding to something. So tell them and use your words while you explain something or while you're doing something, because if they can't see you, they don't know what you're doing. The tone of their voice is very important. If they're worried, if they really are scared, if they have got something to ask, make sure you are listening to them actively. Because if you can't see them, that's the only clue or that's the only cue you have of what they're feeling. Documentation, make it clear that you're going to write to, your, to the doctor or to the referral specialist, or you're going to copy them and you document it properly because, you know, there's a new area still and people may not be very comfortable or confident. And some documentation you might want to record. The recording might be for the whole consultation. You might have a transcript, a copy of it goes to the patient. So all this has to be set before and you might want to do it. You may not want to do it. You may not have the capability to do it. But these are things you have to bear in mind. And then in the end, make a clear plan. So as we have discussed, I am going to do this, this, this. Do you have any questions? And I always sign off, you know, it was nice to speak to you. I hope it was useful and, and so on. So it is very, very important that you sign off properly as if you were in person, except you're not in person, but don't abruptly keep the phone down. That doesn't go very well. Or I'll speak to you again after the results come back. Something like that. Now, this is our data on uh, COVID-19 and all the outpatient slots that we had. So we had a total of 2,361 uh, slots during the COVID period, of which more than half were oncological slots. And then about 100, about 1,200 were benign slots. We did virtual consultations mainly, face-to-face -face consultations for some patients. And then some, some of these were canceled by the patient of the hospital. So if I was to split it into oncology, 86% of oncological consultations were done, of which majority were virtual. The face-to-face -face ones were mainly flexible cystoscopy because you couldn't do it. So if you've got you know, a, a risk of suspicion, two-week wait, urgent referral, it will be face-to-face -face purely because it's a flexible cystoscopy. Some were canceled by the hospital and the patient, but it wasn't a lot. When it comes to the benign side, 91% of outpatient clinics were done, of which majority, vast majority were virtual, and some were face-to-face. -face. Again, you know, some very few were canceled by the hospital or by the patient. And mainly the face-to-face -face were the lithotripsy ones, where they came in to actually have acute treatment. So a sample consultation, so in the private setup, there's a Zoom has set up a sample consultation of how it should be done, and I've done a few of these. So you have the patient and you both have a, an account. It is pre, it's set up beforehand. And then once this is done, you go in, you know the patient's name, they know the doctor's name. So there's no confusion as to which doctor they are seeing and which patient you are seeing. So there is a setup already. And then there is a virtual waiting room. So you're not just, you know, as soon as you tap, you're not just onto the patient. If you might have two people waiting. Again, they have, they have been given time slots. You go to the virtual waiting room and then only when you click admit that you can actually start the consultation. And if you're not ready, you don't click admit. So they know that you are there, but you are still waiting and the same with you. And you click admit only when you're ready. So that I think is a very good system. And you do have the option of recording the whole thing, sending it to the patient, having a transcript, I don't use the recording bit, but the transcript bit, you know, it's easy to do if you wanted to. And you can send a copy to the patient as well. So I think this is where the, the teleconsultation is going to go. 
and we are just seeing the start of it. There'll be lots of new platforms, provided it is done safely, provided you are trained in it. I think it is going to be the future, not for all consultations. You can't really do a testicle examination on Zoom, but a lot of things you can still do on Zoom or any other platform. So, so there are some do's, which is identification, identify the caregiver if, if it's not the patient and that they are authorized. You should identify yourself, uh, registration number, and min make sure you keep all the records. And the don'ts are, you know, you should not really continue if it's not appropriate, if there is a breach of confidentiality, or it is just not right in an acute and emergency situation where they might need some other type of help. And, and these was published by the Indian Telemedicine Guidelines. So just in a nutshell, I think telemedicine and telehealth is here to stay. There are several advantages. Patient experience could be a lot better. They don't have to come through the traffic. They're not waiting in the waiting room outside. They're on the laptop or whatever and on the virtual uh, uh, facade. The quality of care, you can argue, is a little bit better because you can action things immediately. Cost, of course, is, is less. Depends on what the charge is for virtual consultation. But, you know, most people would have a preset and overall cost will decrease. Accessibility, yes, the, the platform should be safe and secure. Uh, and again, it should be accessible to both parties. So they have to be internet savvy. They have to have the same platform and so on. It should be clinic, clinically efficient. And I think a lot of in-person visits can be cut down by using this because they are not always necessary. Just a brief mention about uh, telesurgery. This is a paper we published a couple of years ago. And there are various, I mean, this has already happened. So I've kept this brief, but you know, you can have things like life surgery, which we are all used to from a number of years. You can have teletraining where the person is giving some guide through teletraining. You can have telementoring where the, the person who is guiding you can actually come on the screen and maybe point out what you're doing or point out an area which you need to be more focused on. Teleassistance where they can do parts of the procedure. So you're doing it, but they have the option of taking over and doing it. And then full telesurgery where the, remotely they are in another place and they're doing the whole surgery for you. And I know the robotic surgery has, has been pioneered and Da Vinci has done a lot of these. So these are the various steps when it comes to uh, telesurgery or, or telerobotic or teletraining, however you might call it. And this is the different aspects from simple life surgery that is being telecast to complete telesurgery where someone is, else is performing it miles away. And a lot of this is then down to the internet connectivity. You know, you can't do it with uh, a, an old-fashioned 3G or 4G. You probably need much faster internet if you're going to rely on that. Because even that five-second delay, if you're doing teleassistance or telesurgery, would mean a lot different in terms of the outcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, that was an excellent talk on telemedicine. So many minute details you had touched on. Now, thank you for the talk, sir. Can we have uh, Dr. Aditya to resume his talk? I'll come out. Yeah, Zisha, I'll just try sharing this time. I hope I'm audible this time. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So I think we were here and I was discussing that uh, why I'm here currently. And uh, uh, how far we have come through the communication timeline is what I was discussing that uh, my erstwhile teachers used to tell me that they used to get uh, written consultations followed by the dial-in phones following by pagers. And now we have... Uh, just one touch of a phone and you are able to communicate everything to the other part of the world. This is how I personally use WhatsApp. We have groups at PGI and we have a Euro oncology group where our uh, next door uh, uh, oncologist discusses the cut, uh, cutting edge research. And We have various groups like Europathology, Euroradiology groups in which we can discuss about the patients and uh, the nuances of it. We have zonal groups, we have groups pertaining to particular speciality, and we have groups of uh, discussing uh, nuances of the surgery from uh, whatever there is under the roof. 
so timeline if you look at the whatsapp we have come in just a short span of 2 years it was in 2018 that telephonic consultation were amounting to culpable negligence which was ipc 304 thereafter it became telephonic medical consultation that they cannot be criminalized and after covid era just uh, when the uh, lockdown was called in by pm modi the whatsapp for routine consultation became uh, a norm and this is now penetrated within the norms of the medico legal aspects of the country and the ministry of health and family welfare has issued the telemedicine practice guidelines which are wonderful for all those uh, people who are practicing here and whatsapp facebook messenger google hangouts and all those have now penetrated within the uh, norms of this uh, country's uh, giving a uh, uh, consult i'll just want to walk you through a conversation which was a personal one which uh, i came across and we all can recognize that this is a paraphimosis and this was april 6 which was a part of the first lockdown we were having and uh, one of my uh, close uh, uh, known to came up that his father is having this paraphimosis and he was thinking of that he can go over the night can go by and he can go next morning to the visit the doctor but i counseled him that uh, it struck to me that i can share some videos and photographs to him and uh, he might be able to reduce it and within a 10 to 12 minute span period he was able to do it on his own so even if you are able to make a difference in even one of these cases you are doing a, a lot over these whatsapp consultations however the things can go wrong on the other side and uh, you can see that this was uh, in local punjab area that one of the pediatrician who simply asked for his uh, share of uh, consultation fees uh, was in a soup where a complaint was filed against him and in the uh, against him uh, uh, and in term and the indian medical association had to intervene so as to take him out of the soup just on the lighter side uh, that we are uh, all using social media right and left and uh, uh, that is the first thing in the morning that you look for your phone and search what is there in the whatsapp what is there in the other social media platforms and we are missing out probably on the children which are uh, the small things which are there a uh, little bit about the spouses and and it, we are becoming a lot more dependent on these social media platforms however no, not only on the personal experience which comes in factored into it uh, it's now evidence based medicine and jeremy has shown a lot of data about social media especially twitter and similarly if you go into whatsapp there is a lot of uh, data which is available right from across specialty be it surgery be it orthopedics dermatology emergency medical teams similarly for urology also there have been a lot of data which has been published presented in the conferences uh, across uh, countries in a nutshell uh, i would like to say that whatsapp has improved the communication over period of time you don't require a formal computer and it's pretty much time saving there's a possibility of an immediate response and the patient expects that also out of you uh there is a reduction of consultation time smoothing of hierarchy in the institutional protocols the junior doctors can contact the senior doctor and uh, the hierarchy has been diminished and we are uh, coming much closer on the flip side you have a sense of urgency you need to stay online 24 hours of the day there is impossibility to print a record and the clinical information is not being included in the medical records you have difficulty identifying patients during the chat so that is another difficulty which is encountered so uh, there are ethical consideration uh, mark zuckerberg was in a soup for it and uh, consent now it has been clearly stated by the government of india guidelines that if the patient is seeking consult on whatsapp uh, it it is a Im implied consent which is there the end to end encryption is much much uh, more mandatory which is whatsapp is a kind of a platform and uh, obviously there is a no substitute for clinical examination whenever you are using these platforms for Uh, uh for uh, giving consults and th that is the rider which you need to tell the patient up front these are the hipaa guidelines which are 10 commandment these are from us now we have our own uh, very own telemedicine consult uh, this was just before the covid era that it whatsapp and the use of teleconsult was not only frowned upon through these media but was illegal to use but now uh, after covid it has changed now we have telemedicine practice guidelines you can prescribe uh, certain medicines which are enlisted in category o a and b and uh, you can also ask for your same fees which you are uh, charging in your clinic the risk stratification as jeremy has touched upon that you must uh, be in a low risk profile you can maintain your professional web page a personal social media profile however you should uh, deter yourself from posting work uh, related content on social media even if it is only intended for other healthcare team members 
and uh, medical advice on open online forum should be avoided and should be one to one so i'll conclude by saying the digital and social media have become necessary elements uh, for uh, both patients and practicing medicine its use in post covid era is bound to increase and you must monitor your digital presence by practicing low risk behavior you should be aware of the local and the national guidelines and be aware of the local rules and you should stay medical legally safe thank you aditya thank you for a nice talk now can we move to dr vinit gaur for the most awaited talk on webinars it has become a pandemic now uh thank you aditya needs to allow me to share screen yeah yes sir all right i'm just going to uh i hope everybody is able to hear me and see my screen as well so i'd like to uh take this opportunity to first thank for the uh, topic which was given to me which is a sea of webinars in which ship to sail on the pertaining topic is prevalent and relevant because we have so many webinars which are ongoing and i think that is the real pandemic at this point of time so i'm dr vinit i work in uh, ang ting fong hospital which is in singapore and uh, like you when this topic was given to me i was equally baffled but i took it upon as a challenge and i said okay think of it if you had to choose which ship to sail on what would you do both if you were presenting as well as if you were hosting a webinar and if you google just for urology alone you'll get pages and pages and pages of webinars which are being hosted but what's important to look is it can be hosted by an individual it can be hosted by a group it can be hosted by a company it can be hosted by a, a basically anybody and it it can be hosted on any so, topic you need you need to share your screen uh, i am okay sorry uh, okay let me try again yeah now we can okay okay so i apologize for that i guess uh, some technical issues there so i was talking about the sea of webinars which and how to decide which one to sail upon and like i said if you google you see uh, an amazing number of uh, screens that pop up showing you the webinars just for neurology and you can have a webinar on any and every topic if you think about it google it you'll get a webinar which is very currently happening and the first reaction when uh, i was given the topic was you know exactly what you are thinking wtf and i thought to myself i said how do i address this topic and then i realized oh actually zishan's asked me to talk about the webinar and to focus on which webinar to attend so i made my talk uh, a little bit academic and uh, a little bit entertaining to try and give you some take homes as well as some understanding of what i have understood both as a host as well as a participant in webinars the definition of a webinar is pretty obvious you need a webcam you need something to screen share and it's a meeting which is held on the internet and there are many uh, synonyms for it it could be just a conference it could be a virtual meeting or a webcast all of them hold good for a webinar the types of webinars can be really depending upon where you work because you can have a webinar to either promote your product from something simple as that or to talk about your institution or to talk about your practice or even to to basically educate again the types of webinars essentially are these six categories which are shown over here but the main reason we use a webinar is because of these uh, fantastic advantages we are seeing uh, we are sharing the screen so you're seeing what's happening in real time webinars are also conducted uh, just like a live surgery sometimes though the internet connectivity is the uh, problem like uh, dr baskar so many alluded we need the 5g technology and i think that's why webinars will be the future once that technology comes in but yes we do need a secure access we want it to be a uh, professional and uh, it, it depends we can have a few participants as low as maybe 5 when you have your own zoom internal meeting for example the uropathology meeting you may have just 10 or 15 participants or we can have a meeting like this where i'm told we have more than 400 participants so you you can use a webinar basically for any number of participants for anything and for any category but i would like you to learn that there's something called an internet internet based learning and teaching which basically has a synchronous and an asynchronous dialogue 
the terms are complicated. What this really means is that everything that encompasses a webinar is either synchronous, which is basically you're, you're talking about it and you're showing it in real time, or it could be asynchronous, which is basically something which is pre-recorded and uh, emails and documents. So that's how internet-based learning is moving. And a webinar, I think, is one of the biggest platforms which is taking internet-based uh, internet learning and teaching to the next level. I personally think a webinar is just like a movie. And I'd like to share this example to show you. Take this meeting, for example. You need, for a movie, a good director. You need some star heroes. And you need very good supporting actors. And Deepak and Aditya, that role can be reversed in another webinar. And you need a multi-purpose jack of all person like me who can't fit into other roles. But the most important thing is this story, which is basically what is the prime focus of your webinar. And today we're talking about social networking while social distancing. And we are trying to give you all an example of how different platforms are so useful. And my topic is webinar. And for that, I'd like to come back to the principal topic, which is C of webinars. And you have to know that there are so many platforms available. So what are the platforms available? And like I said, I'm talking about it from an experience, both as a webinar host, as well as a webinar participant. What is your aim? That's the first thing you need to define when you want to attend or to host a webinar. What is, is that you want from that meeting? Or what is it that you want to convey in that meeting? Who is your target audience? Or which is, or who, are you a part of a target audience which is going to be receiving information? Teaching is definitely a priority. Most of the webinars do want that. It could be within the company, so it could even be on educational platforms. The type of content, I can't emphasize on how important it is. And the host strategies. Now, the host strategies is basically what kind of a population that you really want to influence. And for that, you have webinar tools and meeting apps for which you need to decide which to choose. Currently, I must say, Zoom is probably well-known, most shared, and most used. And it's not because, um, or rather, I would say, it's because of the ease and the uh, advertising that's happened. And also the fact that Zoom is something which is very easy to use, as we'll realize as we move on. Now, if you select the correct platform, and this is something which I just Googled and I realized that um, there are so many platforms. Now, with so many platforms, each platform has some merits and demerits. When you decide to host a webinar, it's imperative that you go into each of these platforms, or at least the better known ones, to understand how well it will suit your meeting. Example, if you know that your meeting is going to have a lot of videos, a lot of participants, then you must have that capacity to have a hosting platform that can take in that. Sometimes you may not be able to host more than 100 people. You're not able to host more than 500 people. So you need to choose a platform based on your needs. And you have to go in a little bit detail to understand that. You know, you know exactly what you want it for. Is it a mentoring session? Is it a coaching session? Is it for activities? Each webinar platform actually tells you its strength. Try to identify which platform will help you in either hosting it or recommending it to somebody who really wants to host it where you are a participant. Something to keep in mind. And how do I choose a webinar system like I told you? You, you go through the details, you understand it. But remember, to, when you are going to host a webinar, you have to be the one who is going to be developing and implementing that particular project on the webinar. And this is something to keep in mind. Most of the audience is not able to really absorb. They are able to understand what you're saying. They're able to uh, imbibe what you're saying, but they can't retain it. And they would definitely want it to be video record for you to go back and listen to it again. And I think, me too, when I participate, I'm constantly asking, is there a video recording available? Because I'd like to go back and listen to it if a topic was interesting, like Professor Vasquez Somani's was very informative, and I would definitely probably want to go back and read it. Or say, when there was so much information, uh, Jeremy Teo on Twitterati, I want to know what else can I do to improve myself? So video recording is something which every platform host really must keep in mind. Now, how do I choose? Well. If I have to choose a webinar, I think I would probably be looking more at the urology perspective, right? So I'm going to think of first thing, is that moderation really good? Because sometimes the webinars can get really disinteresting. I really want to know if I'm joining a skills workshop, but does it really complement what it says it does? 
if you're talking about an evidence-based discussion, let's say on a video podcast, will that webinar really justify it? So I look at the speakers, I look at the content in the uh, webinar host, and I look at it whether it's focused or it's just a generalized. You eventually become subspecialized or you eventually have an area of interest in mind. So you really want to look at that webinar, which gives you information pertaining to what you practice. Either it's new or it just may be a revision of what happened. Yes, the, the host can have it for 20 people or 4,000 people. That's their priority. But if you would log into any place, you definitely want to know that if it's a very big audience, sometimes there can be a lot of disturbance. So people, what they do is they host it on a platform, but they share it on a totally different uh, web stream. So that's, that's pretty good. That's what uh, webinars do well. For example, um, you can stream it on every device and that's good because sometimes I have a phone in my hand. Sometimes I have a computer access to me. So I look at all this um, when I try to join a webinar and, I, and I, I have to have good internet connectivity for all this. I mean, that's something which is important. Now, if I'm going to host it, I'm going to be looking at the pricing. I'm definitely going to be looking at features and the ease of using that webinar. Obviously, if I'm going to be paying really a lot of money for a webinar, that itself is a big turn down. And if it's easy to use, I'm definitely going to be looking at it. And I really think that urology webinars is, are here to come and to stay because, I mean, just look at this, AUA, EAU, and even in Singapore, for example, we are all moving towards a virtual platform because we realize maybe it was COVID, maybe it's this pandemic, which has probably initiated this, but we, we do realize that the reach or the outreach is tremendous. So I think it's very important that all future uh, event organizers have to keep webinars as something in their armatorium for presentations. And additional premium features come in. Uh, well, nothing comes to free, but some, some simple, simple which is uh, there on Zoom, for example, is you just click and join. They have high definition recordings. They actually have an option of giving you analytics, just like um, uh, Twitter has. You really want to know how much has your audience engagement been, how much has your audience attendance been. It's not just an ego boost. It's something which you want to know if you want to carry on doing this. So you, you, you want the audience to tell you what they liked and what they didn't like. Polling is a great way for audience interaction. The question and answers that go back and forth, the last webinar which I attended and I hosted, we answered more than 100 questions and I realized that the audience wants the question and answers because this is a platform where they are interacting with you. Sometimes you go for a big conference meeting and you can't do that, but it's something which you have to uh, get your host to coordinate very well for you. And I would like flexibility in my pricing if I'm going to have a platform. What's important is you have to really have a good video and an easy interface. That is the critical part of any web-based platform. And you know the influence of uh, webinars and webcasts, and it's, it's gone up so high now that almost 66% of the companies agree that yes, it's a definite way to move forward. Now, which I would avoid. I think it's a personal choice. The only webinar which I think I would not go to is if I know it doesn't interest me. Having said that, if I'm hosting it as a platform, I think these are some of the issues. Security issues, it's not flexible. Sometimes platforms don't explain to you what exactly you're going to get. A, a poor audiovisual connectivity is definitely a turn off for me. I can't stream or I can't record is also a turn off for me. And very importantly, worms. I'm not talking about worms as in sickness worms, but we all talk about the internet hacking. And yes, it can happen. So something to keep in mind when you see a platform at a, as a whole. What I will avoid as a urologist, definitely if I, mean, I speak for myself and probably I think this is, it resonates with everybody. I would not go to a meeting which is not suitable timing. If it's not specific enough today, if I have to pay, no, I think I would reconsider. Definitely if it's not my area of interest and if it's too complicated a registration process. And I tell you what, if you have too many webinars, you're definitely going to get uh, really, really tired of it. So choose your webinar uh, based on all these informations that you have. Definitely, most importantly, will be your area of interest. And webinars, again, in this era of internet of connectivity, uh, the, the way people adopt to technology is amazing. I mean, you, this is just to show you how uh, the Internet of Things happen. But for example, gaming platforms, I mean, these two games were adopted by millions of people in just 20 to 30 days. The same thing is happening with webinar. It's because we have a linear uh, exponential increase in the number of gadgets which are connected to the Internet. 
And the connected devices being 50 billion, you can imagine the outreach it has to the population. And a phone is in everybody's hands. So a webinar is a great way to communicate with everybody. But of course, with every single um, social media or any platform, uh, internet platform which is available, you must have bylaws. I couldn't come across any bylaws as such. And I tell you why we need bylaws. Now I'm going to give you a quick example of Zoom. You know, there was a lot of controversy about Zoom. Suddenly the founder who said, I only sleep and eat Zoom. And then this was just yesterday, which he released a video. The Zoom bombing happened where thousands of people said, oh, we are being hacked. Google banned it. There were new concerns, security issues. And all this started from this tweet from, uh, uh, from Boris Johnson. And the reason is, if you look at this screen, is basically it revealed his IP address. And that's when he uh, the admittedly, the owner said, we didn't think about privacy. And that is the problem. And there was a lot of issue whether this is being hosted through a country which could be spying on us. But then they went out to clarify. They said, no, we are an American country. And I think we are not successful. We are in the middle of a crisis, which is both pandemic as well as um, for a webinar crisis. And they realized that piracy and privacy is something which is critical for them to have a look at. And I think they're looking into that issue, but yet it's one of the most um, user-friendly platform and everybody's kind of using that now. Now, the last thing is take-home messages. And I think take-home messages on webinars is rather easy to tell you. Firstly, if you are going to be hosting, this is something to keep in mind. You really need to identify properly your population. You need to create the entire setup properly. A small thing to do is always test your webinar platform before the meeting. We've had issues just on the day of meeting, which is internet connectivity, but if the platform itself is not working on that day, your webinar is a flop. And of course, an important thing to look at is if you look at it in, in it's kind of an act into part one, part two, part three, part four. On the, what happens before is very important where you really need to uh, advertise. So you must have a good, uh, you know, apart from having good speakers and content, you really need to advertise it. And today, I think with the sea of webinars, it's critical for you to reach out to your friends, colleagues, using all the internet media platforms to tell them, we are trying to give you a good um, webinar. Please join us and we'll be happy to share and discuss all the content that we have. And I think the reasons to run webinars in 2020, if you look at it, is it's cost efficient. It's definitely environmental friendly. And these are some of the other uh, points which are basically, um, it helps you to grow needs. You know, a small thing is people may be shy to come on a conference platform, but they're very happy to come on a webinar. And you can hide your face if you want to, but then you can, you're, you're e easily able to reach out to a bigger population. It's scalable. This content is there on the internet means it's evergreen. And the most important thing that you must keep in mind is who are the speakers and how do you promote your webinar? Which is why it's sometimes good to be backed up with a company maybe not with vested interest, but definitely keen to promote education. And education platforms is another thing which you should consider if you want to have webinars. And that's why they develop, like iTrue, is really doing a wonderful job in the field of education. And I think it's great that we have a webinar like this because it reaches out to so many people telling everybody what's important in social networking today. So with, with anything comes responsibility. And uh, we try to stay scientific, stay ethical, talk sense, because at the end of the webinar, only two things are going to happen. Either you're going to be telling the audience mute, mute, but then sometimes the audience is going to be saying, oh, for God's sake, please mute the speaker. Or at the end of it, they're going to say, wow, you're really awesome. So you hope for this and you hope for the latter. So think about it when you prepare uh, your webinar. And with that, I would say it doesn't matter whether you come with this face, you, you, know, you, you must have an etiquette, uh, but it's important to understand that a webinar is something which you're sharing information and try to keep it scientific it could be taken as this one picture with the famous dialogue where they said everything is about entertainment 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 but yeah we are talking about a webinar we're not talking about a movie and and i would say that i true platform today and the webinar that we are sharing we are trying to take e-learning and we're trying to take education to a different level to tell you that webinars are here to stay and it is important and you must really uh, adopt this as a new form of uh, communication. Thank you so much. Dr. Vineet, I would say that was amazing. And that was an eye opener on webinars and you have done justice for this topic. Thank you all the, uh, thank, I, mean, I would like to thank all the panel members for the excellent crisp content of your presentation. 
I'm sure with this webinar, many of us would be benefited in using social media platform in our interest. And we all will be utilizing these platforms so much more than just plain old simple communication. Now quickly, we shall go to the questions. I'll put a presentation on various questions which have been asked during this webinar. And I would be directing it to each speaker. And later maybe, you know, the panel can you know, join the discussion. So the first question is to Dr. Deepak Raghuri. What precautions should, we, should I take to maintain patient privacy? Yeah, like I was just highlighting in my talk uh, that maintaining patient privacy is one of the most important things that we should do, not only on Twitter, but on any of these social media platforms. For that, you should able to do some research on what the cyber laws actually say in our country, but we are still in a very nascent stage. Uh, uh, we, we are soon going to get a lot of stringent laws in it. The idea is, remember one thing, the patient identity exposure needn't necessarily be a picture of a patient's face. Any indirect exposure of identity in terms of records or in terms of uh, a situational uh, picture or anything that can indirectly lead to a patient's oh, identity yeah. exposure becomes uh, an issue with privacy. So the best advice there would be not to take any of the records patient uh, from the patient's records directly to share on social media. It could be in a, a, a short gist form of your own uh, typing of the content and if you're using the pictures of course like we all do make sure that the images are cropped enough so that the identity of the patient is not revealed much so take care on all aspects depending on the kind of file you share and depending on kind of videos you share you'll have to uh, uh, maintain the patient privacy when you share it thank you so professor somani Will, tele will telemedicine ever pick up in a country like India, where majority of the rural population don't have access to proper healthcare facilities? In addition, I should probably turn it around and I should argue and say telemedicine is perfectly seated in a country like India, and I'll tell you why. If you look at the history of telemedicine, 1993, there is no internet. That's when telemedicine started. And what is the ethos of telemedicine? You know, you should be able to serve when you're not physically being there. And most people in India, you know, will have some kind of mobile phone. You know, almost everyone now, even in villages, will have a mobile phone. So not all kind of uh, healthcare checkups or advice can be given, but a lot of teleconsultations can happen. And don't forget, a lot of them might have uh, videos. The question is, is it possible? Yes. Is, can it be done safely? This, this is where the problem is. So, for example, if they've got a lesion, if they've got a facility to safely take a picture and send it, upload it somewhere, which you can see. If it's an obvious cancer, then you can give a very early diagnosis or advise them to seek help early. And I think telemedicine is perfectly suited for that purposes because not everywhere the doctors can go or the healthcare might suffer. And if you have got portals where they can go and request or there's a teleconsultation happening, uh, then I think it will be very successful. It will have to be created around an infrastructure that can be you know, that can help. Uh, but I think it's a great potential. And digital India, I mean, you know, it is everywhere. And I think this is one of the advantages of uh, the digitization that has happened. Thanks. And Vinit, would you want to answer it? How is it going in your country right now, telemedicine? Yeah, I completely agree with the, what uh, Dr. Somani has said. We do telemedicine. Uh, it's not yet, um, well, it's, it's not monetary, we do it free. We, we do video conferencing very limitedly, but I do find one particular problem with telemedicine is that sometimes patients forget that, <laughs> um, you know, it's a limited time and they tend to take longer than uh, a real consult. But yes, I completely, completely think that this is, uh, to me, for example, follow-ups of patients is perfect. The first visit, I'm still not convinced, but I'm sure with the technology evolving, and uh, with, with the proper guidelines coming, it will be the one to look for. Thank you. Can I ask a question for Dr. Somani? Yeah. Uh, you I'm amazed by the percentage of clinics being done over you know, telemedicine. And do you think this will last after uh, COVID-19? Uh, not to the same proportion. I think it will last after COVID-19 because a lot of times we realize that 
for a lot of it's a mindset you see in the beginning they have never used telemedicine so the mindset is a patient has to be there we must see them and we are one of the very big covid hospitals we were expecting at one point 250 ic admissions in our hospital thankfully it didn't happen so we were expecting a big surge of patients to come in now in that we made a conscience a decision that unless you have to examine and testicular lumps being one of them rest everybody we thought okay you might not be able to give as good a consultation without doing a dre but is a dre must dre is a digital rectal examination is it a must for all prostate patients you know in this era probably not you could you know for a lot of them you might end up being mri anyway or a, a next psa anyway so th- which is why we decided that unless they must come in we will try not to i don't think we will be doing so many in time but i do think there is a trend of doing a lot of especially for kidney stone patients or bph patients how you know you don't always have to bring them in so there will be a trend and we will be doing more of it than before covid for sure thank you jeremy this question was asked before your presentation i'm sure like you know you uh, told everything about research but we would like you to you know comment on this again do you yeah. think it has the power to contribute to research if so how can i make use of it so i definitely think uh twitter or social media platforms can enhance research work but we need to be aware of the advantages and disadvantages of social media platform the best thing about it is sourcing of data you can easily um get people who are interested who share similar interests to get on board but the problem is the the, the follow up issues are they really um keen to to do it in a very persistent manner how can you ensure the quality of the conduct of the study etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think um to make it brief if we are doing simple studies for example surveys is excellent if you are doing observational studies like what burst has been doing like the identify study or the resect study that they are doing um in the coming year I think these observational studies is excellent. They can gather over 100 centers, more than 10,000 patients within a year. That's excellent. But if you really want to do really clinical trials it's virtually impossible uh, because you you can't really ensure the quality of the of the data. Um the other part which I think is very interesting it will be the social media analytic part. But this will need some um commitments you really need to learn about the analytic tools before you can really have some studies on that another area would be uh, misinformation this is what stacy has been doing before uh, i think we we have a talk on this as well uh regarding how accurate the data is or um how you can respect patient privacy during the dissemination of information in fact um being healthcare professionals we have the obligation to ensure that the things that we shared out they are accurate and we need to make sure that everything is done in an appropriate manner and i really think that um um this error needs more research work um and the study by stacy looking into youtube videos for example uh, it's very unfortunate that videos that uh you did the greatest amount of engagement greatest amount of views they tend to be those videos with the lowest quality uh, in a way it makes sense as well isn't it but i think this area as a researcher or as a urologist really need to work on it uh, more thoroughly in future thank you so the next question is for aditya prakash sharma can we prescribe medicines over whatsapp uh yes ishan i briefly touched upon that uh, now with the telemedicine consultation available as a part of ministry of health and family welfare guideline they have uh, elaborately stated which drugs can be given and which not so they stated uh, category o drugs which are over the counter drugs can be prescribed straight away there is a list of category a drugs which can be given on the first visit then there is a category b drugs which includes the anti hypertensive anti diabetics which can be given to the patients who are under your follow up and uh, there is a schedule x drugs like narcotics the tramadol the morphines which are cannot be prescribed over teleconsultation so so i will advise uh, people to go through those uh, guidelines and they will be more stringent as the time passes by thank you aditya 
think more than the, uh, the, the, I mean, the prescription on WhatsApp as physicians and doctors, we should be sure about the identity of the patient first. Make sure if the patient is your own uh, old patient or if the, the identity has already been established, then feel free to prescribe the drugs because you know the case of the patient in detail. But if, if it's, it's a new patient who's trying to get in touch and you're for the first time speaking to somebody, I would suggest avoid any prescriptions on WhatsApp. In fact, any, any form of prescriptions. And also, there's a gray area right now because because of COVID, a lot of these patients are asking for a prescription over the phone when they have to travel, when they have to take yeah. the drugs for someone else. So that's yes. again a gray zone. You know, it's not clearly mentioned. You know, whether you can there's, do it. Or there is a defined format as to how you should send a prescription across, even on a WhatsApp. So make sure you follow that format, and that there are no errors from your end because. Interpretation and misinterpretation is one of the most uh, challenging things when you send prescriptions on, on uh, telephones. Yeah. So that's the only thing we should be very careful about. Thank you. So it's understandable that uh, the prescription carries the same weightage as you are going to give it in a person uh, consultation. So you must take care of these things. And if at all you are not uh, comfortable giving the consult at this point of time, you point, want the patient to be present in person, you must tell him or her. If I may just comment on this small thing, it, uh, alluding to your uh, prescription of uh, medicines, I think the most important thing is to have a documentation of what you do. And even for medical certificates, for example, you can't just give somebody uh, what we call as an MC based on a conversation you had unless you document it and you identify the patient, the patient's particulars. So you, if you do it on WhatsApp, I, I understand it's going to be different in every country, but it's great for a patient, but documentation of what you did in your computer system will be something that you must have for legal implications. True. The guidelines demand to have a copy to yourself, whatever you wish, if certificates or a prescription, you should maintain a data of them. Yeah. Thank you. So this question is to Dr. Vinit Kaur. Do you think it is wise to show semi-life surgeries in webinar as any age population can access the content do you think there is a need for a disclaimer? Yes, uh, a very, very pertinent point. Look, if you are hosting anything on the internet, anything that you put up is basically there for anybody to see at any point of time. And you can't really say this is an age-based uh, population. Uh, you only 20 years and above can see it, et cetera, et cetera. Look, you host a semi-life surgery, you have taken permission from the patient that your material is going to be viewed. Now he can, it, you have to decide and be responsible, like I said, ethically, as well as socially, as to where are you going to show this kind of surgery. If you're going to host it, um, you put it on YouTube, for example, you can't control it. So a disclaimer, I think, is just a very polite way of saying, um, yes, anybody can see it. And exercising control, whether it's something not in your hands maybe eventually there will be some regulations like Facebook, for example, if you show a photograph which has some nudity, maybe just a patient's genitalia, they take it off and they tell you that you violated the uh, act. So some things like this are coming in and I think they will re get regulated. And I really feel COVID has been the opportunity for a lot of platform hosts to really reconsider and introduce uh, bylaws and platforms. If I can just add there, Zishan, I think it's also, if you have webinars which are strictly by, you know, pre-registration, or if you have, you know, life surgery, which is in a, for example, the EAU, Eurolithiasis Forum, I was go going to go to Greece, but they can't. So now people who, the participants will have special registration that only they can. So even if you stream it, it is not for everyone to see. So you need to have some kind of lock and key where you are locked on your side, only those with the key, we can open and view it. And that way you can control it. Do you think they're going to go ahead with live surgeries in future during the webinars? Because everybody's trying to be more innovative, you know. Semi-live is, okay, understood, you can edit it. But do you think okay. they're going to have live surgeries as, in, as a virtual conference? Interestingly, you asked this point. Um, there are, I know the limitation of live surgery is the the internet connectivity. Uh, with 5G technology, which is most likely going to come, I think the live surgeries will probably become a reality on webinars because 
you don't have to get your surgeon to come down to a different place to operate. You can ask him in his operation theater setup how he can do the surgery and relate. But again, it will probably, like um, Dr. Baskar said, it's definitely something which you want to allow a certain set of people to log in, access it, see it, and log out. And if you really want to see it again, you probably have to be given a key to access it again. But yes, to answer your question, live surgeries will be the format uh, soon. Um, we are going to have a mixed virtual platform, which is also being introduced in Eurofair. So semi-live is already there, and live surgeries is probably what's going to happen in the next uh, three to four years. Thank you. So this question is to Aditya Prakash Sharma. Am I supposed to be blamed if I don't pick up a WhatsApp call or don't reply to a patient's message? That's a good one. It's an interesting question there, Zishan. And there are two parts of it. Is one is that if you don't pick up a WhatsApp call, and the other part is you don't reply to a patient's message, you have, yeah, and the patient can see that those two blue ticks are there, and you have seen the message and it's still not replied. So uh, there are no clear guidelines regarding those. If you are not picking up, I don't think you are liable for any uh, answer answerable to him or to any legalities there. But if you have seen that there was some urgent sense uh, there in the patient's message, you need to at least reply in the form that either you were busy earlier and you need to look at, go right away to a, a visit a RMP nearby. You need to facilitate depending upon the urgency that is the discretion of your, uh, this thing. And it more, more, it has more to take with the human, humane nature rather than the medical legal nature of the query there. Um, I think anybody else, Dr. Bhaskar want to add something? So yeah, please. I think Bhaskar, yeah, so you know, this is very interesting. Okay. I mean, I, I have never given my phone number to any of my patients. Now I know practices vary and in India it's, my practice is more prevalent here. So there is all for us, there is always a middle person. It will be the registrar, it will be my secretary, it will be somebody else. So I so for me, this doesn't apply directly, unless it's a friend who, you know, it just doesn't apply. And it's very interesting. But this is a very I mean, we should probably do it with uh, all the panel's help, Vineet and Jeremy and Deepak. We should probably do a survey of why and wh why would I give it to my number to a patient? I mean, they can call any time. I don't want to disturb any time. I want my life to have some control. And if there is a problem, you put system in place, you know, so you, they're not left hung and dry. You, you have a system in place. You tell them you can contact the hospital. The hospital will have a junior doctor who can advise you or they will contact me or I'll come and see you. But I will never give my number. I have never done it. I don't intend to. You know, I, if I may add to this, uh, you take a bank, for example, and most of the banking people, they have bots as they're, uh, as they're answering. So you have a standardized set of questions which can be answered. So maybe that's one way. But yes, I completely agree with you, Dr. Baskar, that giving your phone number, imagine you give it to about 100 patients or 200 patients, you forget it. You're going to look like a zombie every time they call you up. Yeah, but I'll, I'll finish off this. Uh, we are neck deep into this, Dr. Baskar. Like you said, yeah, we, there's no way back now. Our number is all over the place. Yeah. We are more popular than the 911, if, if you have to say that way. So, like, if I have to talk of, like, Aditya directly said that there are no guidelines. He's right about it. But, yes, there is another part of the guideline which says that you have to be giving a patient a number as to where he has to get in touch on an emergency basis, like you said. That is all is warranted. It didn't necessarily be your personal number. They have to have one number to get in touch to the hospital, which they would anyway have it. So that's all is enough. So don't bother about you. You need not pick up your call or you're not implied for it. And, and knowing a lot of Indian urologists who are friends, most people have two numbers. On a day you don't want to, at least you can switch off your phone. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Zishan, do you have the next question? Zishan, Zishan. can you hear me? It's frozen, I think. Screen is yeah, you know, Aditya, there's a question which has come up for you, which says, do you have concerns about cybercrime when you are uh, sending and uh, receiving sensitive images in WhatsApp, in oh. urology? Oh, that's another interesting question, sir. Concern regarding cybercrime. Um, I never came across such, but yes, that can be a potential thing there because you, you never know and you, are, you are never know who on the other side is. So, so that's what important is when, whenever you are dealing with these cases, you must know the identity of the patient there and you must tell your identity as well. So that that's what the guidelines say. And uh, 
as far as i am concerned uh, in the institutional we have a protocol similar to that uh, dr bhaskar was saying the uh, the patients are registering with us uh, at the hospital and we are calling them back on their telephone number so so that's how it is working out uh, currently at pgi and i haven't come across uh, such a scenario in uh, urology currently yeah cyber laws in india i guess are still in a very nascent stage so we are we still catching up with uh, the cyber laws uh, but there is no clear statement on these things like you so said you have to uh, save your skin be very sure about the identity of the patient uh, person who is actually sending you or you sending images of these relevance we tend to do that isn't it we we just click pictures left right and center of a patient and share so maybe we should be careful doing that i guess jishin is back otherwise there is another question in the chat for dr uh, baskar uh, do you think the new technology such as telemedicine is an adjunct to existing consultation rather than a replacement i think it, it very much depends on uh, the the diagnosis the patient presentation i don't think there is any replacement for a face to face consultation period you know if if i was a patient and i had a chance to meet my doctor in person then i would very much like to do so however if i know that there is something that i could do through through a tele let's say i have a small skin you know rash or something on my hand and i know that i could do it over a the telephone they don't really need to examine me as such uh then you know do, do i really need to go and see if that option exists maybe not so i don't think it will replace face to face i do feel that it is not not an adjunct for a lot of follow ups you know if you know for example you know that you've done a ct scan there's no stone on a ct scan the renal colic has settled so you can easily call the patient say how is your symptoms yeah it's settled yeah your scan was fine your blood test urine test were all fine now do you really want that patient to come all the way just to be given the shot and some might say well actually that's how it's practiced so this also brings into the second question which i know we had what what about the fee should it be free is it the same charge is it a different charge i think it's what is agreed with the patient from beforehand so they should know what the charge is that will depend on your hospital your uh, provider their insurance so in uk i can tell you that a lot of insurance companies have agreed to match the face to face consultation fee it's no different so it is up to you and because of covid a lot of patients don't want to come to the hospital you know they would rather you call them and you do a telephone consultation and once it opens up i guess now it, it gives a power to the patients to choose between face to face and uh, to to come in they don't have to do it face to face they don't have to come in they have a choice and in some situation you can say actually i would rather i see you myself i need to examine you or whatever or you need to do a flow rate i can't just diagnose the obstruction for your prostate just by listening to your symptoms or you can say actually this is straight forward i just listen to you so i think it is a it is a good armamentarium to have for future and it will have to suit horses for courses so you need to decide when you want to use it thank you the next question is to vinit gohar will yes. webinars yeah will webinars and virtual conferences replace physical conferences uh personally i think they are they are not here to replace but they are definitely uh, going to be one of the ways in which they are going to uh, meetings are going to be held i i i can't take away social interaction um on a personal level i like to go to a meeting as much as to to attend and to get the educational content but it's also to meet friends to uh, to greet people if the place is nice that's an added bonus but a lot of people do think that webinars are a better way because think of it uh, you can't have 400 500 people sitting in a room sometimes you can't have 400 500 people being able to spend money to reach some of the bigger conferences and there are so many conferences itself which are held which are expensive they have fantastic content but at times even i feel bad oh i wish i could go there there are we are practicing urologists we we may not be able to make it there so i think it's going to be an alternative but what most conferences i think are going to do is definitely have a virtual platform either before during i'm mean not before of course but during or after the conference to show the content thank you ishan if i can add from the clinician point of view i had six conferences booked in the last 8 7 8 weeks i'm so glad i could spend the time with my family because a lot of them were one talk or whatever you can still do them through the webinars and i agree that it would be nice to go but sometimes you don't have the time 
you know, there's a financial implication and you can use the same thing, same content, same message to wider audience through this. I hope it doesn't replace the normal conferences because we do need that social <laughs> Part of it is required. I just want to add one more thing is that, um, uh, of course, um, many urologists, uh, like in Asian countries, uh, perhaps they are not as financially capable. It's not very easy for them to really go to an international conference. And I think um, the introduction of webinars is really fantastic, highly efficient. Uh, so many different types of uh, talks, webinars, they can choose what they want to watch. I think this is something that we should try to, you know, continue even after COVID-19. I think it serves a big role, especially for the perhaps less developed countries. True. Yeah. Since we are, we are, uh, uh, we have I2 representation group, I think one critical area which a webinar can contribute is to actually have a teaching series dedicated for example, if you want to teach a certain procedure, the pros and the cons, so you can actually use something like a webinar to even create a mini teaching series. And you'll be surprised at how many residents across the world, they are so enthusiastic about joining these mini teaching series. So if not bigger webinars, like hosting them for bigger conferences, small things like a mini teaching series is also quite useful. That's you know, I think all the speakers were there. We should take them up all on this. On I should be <laughs> yeah, everyone, all the faces were, we are, there, you know. I, we are, yeah. we have committed on camera. <laughs> we are on board, They're all amazing speakers. So the next question is to Dr. Deepak. How can I, how can Twitter expand my practice in India or globally? Yeah. Dr. Deepak. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Expanding your practice. If you have to look at your presence on Twitter, in direct proportion to expanding your practice might not be an equation which we're talking about, but yes, it would expand your, uh, the presence or in the social media, or the quotient of, because the younger generation, like I was actually speaking on social media uh, relevance in the younger generation, the so-called generation Zs, yeah, they spend a lot of time on their mobile phones or knowing about health related issues and more than 80% actually trust the content on the internet. So they would obviously trust a doctor sitting on a social media platform themselves. And these are the people who are going to be surrounding you in the near future. Those are more than 70% if, if you look at the stats. So these young generation uh, individuals are your future patients. Touch what we, they need want us, but the day they need, but they're going to get to their social media. But yes, uh, your presence in Twitter might not be an immediate conversion as increase in practice, but your presence overall in social media platforms will definitely gather its momentum as the day goes by. Thank you. So the next question is to Jeremy. How do you improve the number of followers? Because you will have maximum number of followers, of followers among us. So um, personally, I think um, the idea is how you can engage with or target the audience. So for me, I really want to have a um, urological community in Twitter platform. So all my tweets are you know, related to urology. So generally, um, um, just now I've presented some results in my talk, how you can uh, build successful tweets. So generally, if you have more contents with photos, mention more people, um, it will be successful. And this is based on individual tweets. But the other thing is that um, if you increase the number of exposures, increase the number of encounters, then that will be very helpful as well. But the art is how you can uh, make a balance. Don't tweet you know, 10 times, 20 times a day, how you can try to maximize your exposure, but avoid uh, getting being very irritating that's the art and uh, i'm really i believe everybody here knows how to do it actually Thank you. I, if i may yeah. if i may jive, uh, jeremy first you need to change your name as dr jeremy Thiel. that's one thing the second thing is you need to be really diplomatic on social media i think that really helps to go a long way so the next question is to dr baskar somani do you think telemedicine consults should be recorded for future litigations? This, you know, this is a very interesting one because for our uh, private clinics here, the platform we were given, there was an, initially they said everything will be recorded. And then there was a, 
this thing whether the surgeon and the patient should both have a say in this because the patient may not want it recorded and the surgeon may not want it recorded. The second thing is how is the recording going to be kept safe? Because when you record something, you have to make sure it is not just recorded, but it's also safely stored because we know that anything that is on software can be hacked. So I think the important thing is to give the, if you have a safe way of doing it, you can give the patient an option to say, you know, if you want to, we can do the recording and send it. But really the question is, why are we doing it? If it's for medical legal purposes, we don't currently record our consultations. So how is telemedicine different? If it's for the purposes of patient, because they're not there face to face, sometimes they, might, they may not ask the questions. If it's for that, so that the patient can just look at it again and maybe they forgot to ask something because when you're physically not there, maybe that interaction is missing, then it's different. But certainly you need to have consent for both parties. I don't think it should be mandatory. I think better than just recording it, maybe a transcript of what they said, what you said, or how it went is probably better because then there is no issue of uh, storage and hacking and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't normally do it now. So why would you do it just because it is over the teleconsultation? So the option should be there. I don't think it should be mandatory. There's another question asked. Is there any smartphone app to keep track on the medical records? I have no idea, but I know that some platforms charge extra yeah. and they can track it. Uh, but whether it's safe and whether you know they can be hacked and so on, we know all the big platforms have been hacked. So I suspect there is no safe platform at the moment that people can say, yes, you know, we will never be hacked. We have never been hacked. Dr. Deepak, want to add on to this? Uh, I agree with Dr. Baskar. When there's, there's no platform which can give you 100% uh, guarantee on their security. But there are quite a few number of apps which actually do this uh, telemedicine consult. But not all of them have a recording uh, capability. And uh, they do, in fact, ask you whether you need it or not. And a lot of issues on storing those data with cloud-based or with it has to be within your hospital system. Integration with your hospital management system, which not all hospital management systems would allow you to do that. So there, there is collateral damage with there's uh, uh, telemedicine apps too. So it has to be tailored to your needs and you should be careful about uh, the, the security concerns. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Zishan, when I was in Beijing, I met this very interesting gentleman who um, is waiting for 5G technology to take on because what he is inventing, and I think it, it may come up, you can have your conversation with your patient in your room, on your phone, in any social media, etc. All it has to be is to link to that app account. Every single information that you talk about or you share or you even, uh, you know, prescriptions, for example, or uh, your comments that you give, will all be digitalized and stored on that app. And that server belongs only to you. It's not available for everybody else. It was a very interesting concept that he had, uh, but I don't know when it will come into work. Nice, that'd be great. So the next question is to you, Dr. Vinay. Should there be a common body to regulate these educational webinars? I don't think this ever possible to have a common body for webinars, but I think, for example, if um, um, let's say uh, you're hosting a webinar in your country or in your hospital, then there has to be regulations and rules. So similarly, it would, it, maybe EAU will have its own rules and regulations or a bigger bo anybody. Um, I don't think it's possible to have a common central platform for this. Okay, there's one more question. Uh, I mean, just now somebody has asked. They say life surgery is life, life surgery safe using webinar because the surgeon operates in his own environment. Well, uh, life, life surgery is dangerous done on a day-to-day -day basis, done in a conference or on a webinar. So yeah, the surgeon has to be good, be aware and not be distracted by uh, what's happening on the webinar. Uh, I feel it's a state of mind rather than the place where he's operating, isn't it? You know, the more conscious you are that people are watching you, you tend to get a bit jiffy about it. So it doesn't matter where you're operating. You will be more conscious being at, staying in your own hospital and operating too. <laughs> question one thing I question is, uh, oh, yes, please, sir, go on. What I just, in a webinar, you know, you have one and a half hours. Do you really want to, that guy to be doing life surgery? It becomes so, because in a conference hall, you can interact, you can talk, you can tell he's bad, whatever, you know, you've got people you can share your opinion with. Life surgery for webinars will be so boring personally for me. 
I know. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm watching it, you can't. So for me, semi live or as live, because yeah, I agree with semi live and as live, you can you know record it and you can show the best bits. But actually, you know, it's short of being really, you know, it will be really boring to see somebody on webinar if you're on your own. If it's a group and then somebody is doing it, it's different because then it becomes almost like life surgery. But on your own, which is a concept of webinar, you're just there. I think it will be really, every, a lot of people will be wasting a lot of time when yeah. you're not in the preparation phase. I'm not sure if that will be so inter interesting. I think interesting, very valid point, uh, Dr. Sohani. But I, I just wanted to say uh, a few days ago, I was having a chat with a group of urologists from Africa and they don't have, unfortunately, access. So they actually told me, can you do an RIRS or a micro PCNL and show it live? So I said, oh, that's interesting, but I don't think the rules in my hospital will allow that. <laughs> there are new softwares for this. You know, there's something called Proxime, you know, which uh, Professor Prakar Daskupta is also, you know, uh, speaking about, where you can actually, you know, help people who are in remote areas and tell them how to do, how to operate, and has a little bit of an augmented reality too. So I have used Proxime, Zishan. The only okay. problem is every individual on the other end has to have an account with Proxime. Oh. And there is oh. a limit at the moment. There is a limit to how many people can be allowed. So it is good, but it is not, we still lacking bigger platforms for that. Yeah. So the next question is to either Jeremy or Deepak Gregory. What does a blue tick in on Twitter mean? And when will someone get a blue tick, the blue mark? The celebrity status. Okay, so so um, basically it has to verify your your personal data in order to have the blue tick in Twitter. It it doesn't necess you don't have to be a celebrity to have the blue tick in Twitter. But as far as I know, they have already stopped giving out blue ticks because somehow they do not see any big value from it. So I tried to do it, but I failed to do so. <laughs> so we all are celebrities now. <laughs> okay, please. Yeah, to add to what uh, Jeremy just said, he's right that they have stopped blue ticks. Earlier, it was an option for you to apply to Twitter to verify your account and give you a blue tick. But now it's come the other way around. Twitter by its AI itself chooses who's a person who has got maximum number of followers or at the rate at which the number of followers are being attracted to your account um, they verify an account and then give a blue tick themselves. You don't have a choice. If you're really a celebrity, you'll get a blue tick. How they do Until it. then, you can have a tick for yourself. <laughs> yeah. So this is for Vaskar uh, Somani, sir. Can I charge any amount of for my teleconsultations or is it regulated? That is a very interesting one. So tell me, in India, there are so many urologists. Do everyone charge the same? Probably not. Same thing here, but here what happens is all the insurance company, when you register with them, they will, there's something called as a fee assurance. That means if you're fee assured, you, you cannot charge more than that. And if you want to, you have to tell the patient and the patient has to give the shortfall. So it is much easier when the regulation of fee is done through other platforms and other means. So here the bigger providers will assure your fee up to a certain level. And you cannot charge beyond that. Or you go become fee non-assured, which means they will not recommend patients to you. And you have to be really big to do that. So most people have got a fee assurance and the patients know exactly what they're going to pay. The question is, with telemedicine, can you charge exactly the same? I think that that at the moment, they have allow, they're allowing that because they are not allowed to come to the hospital. Going forward, I'm sure there will be a time when the telemedical consultations will be given less money or you, you'll be paid less compared to face-to-face, -to -face, mainly because there's no room charge, you, the patients are not having to come and wait, you don't have to travel and so on. Uh, should it all be made standardized? It's very difficult when, you know, when, when it's regulated through insurance market, it's easier. When, you know, it's a lot of private based like in India and lots of other countries, then it's very difficult because, you know, there is a competitive market and you can't regularize it in the same way that you can't regularize face-to-face -face consultation. People will probably charge what they want to charge. The only thing is they should make it very clear beforehand what the charge is so there's no hidden charge and you know what patients can expect out of it. What time are they paying for? You know, is it 10 minutes consultation, half an hour? There shouldn't be surprises at the back end. 
when they are just booted off after 10 minutes and they equally if they know it's 10 minute they will not start with the pain in the foot they will start with the real urology problem this is my problem because they know this is what they're getting the doctor for nice so the next question is to aditya prakash will they will the doctor be held accountable for wrong diagnosis and adverse drug reactions uh right ji sir so uh, as far as the guidelines go the, the accountability and the credibility of the prescription is same as that what you are doing for an in person consult so you have to be dead sure of your differentials of your diagnosis if you lack any information on that part you need to gather more information from the patient before you prescribe anything to the patient so so the accountability is same as what you are going to do for an in person consult maybe it gives you much more time to you know you know think about it before you start speaking to the patient about the diagnosis you know that's true that's true probably yes. one thing i will add the decision don't feel scared in a teleconsultation because i'm doing a lot to say i'm not sure i'll consult my colleagues and come back but i'm not sure i'll wait for the results and come back and we'll talk about it next time there is no rush you're not going to win a medal by giving them something which is wrong or based on ineffectual or based on data that is incomplete yeah you must always say we'll come back or you know you need to have that which is more much more often than in real uh, consultation so the last question is for uh, dr vinay is there a platform where i'll be able to access webinars after the live event and can i archive them yes yes the so simple thing youtube for example is one of those platforms which actually hosts most of the uh, uh, people who host webinars will then have a recorded link if you are attending a webinar in a meeting say for example aua or eau they will have their own archive libraries there are uh, already um, archives available which you can uh, log into the if i think if i'm right the royal surgical uh, surgery of medicine they have their own archive of videos and of webinars which have been held so yeah it's it's available is you just have to look for it in the right place okay so i think uh, we're done with the questions any more questions you would like to uh, discuss i just wanted to thank the audience for a wonderful um, uh, webinar interaction the speakers of course are made it exciting but the audience's interaction makes it uh, even more overwhelming and and i have learned a lot from hearing and i am sure the audience would have as well so you know it's, it's nice to have shared that and i and i want to thank you zishan for keeping us all uh, you know in check and then um, targeting the questions such that we we had a very very pleasant discussion thank you so much thank you I think this session went on very well, and you have framed the questions in such. I guess you have answered quite a few of the doubts that might have cropped up. So, good job, Jason. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. I think we are having a short word of thanks by the Intas team. Namaskar, sir. Yeah. Uh, greetings from uh, Intas Pharmaceuticals. Uh, on behalf of uh, Intas, sir, we would like to express very sincere thanks for being with us and uh, our gratitude uh, for enlightening the ever-changing uh, scenario in India, sir. Maybe now schools are on smart classes. Uh, two three months before, people were not even willing to share the smartphone. Now the kids are carrying that. Most of the bankings are happening. so so with the case when so the lockdown lot of complexities were there for commuting from their far up places to the hospitals probably the enlightenment which has been given today to dr bhaskar somani sir dr jeremy dr vinit gohar sir dr deepak sir and dr adit sir we are thankful and as uh, told by dr vinit sir that good moderation is a key so probably that has achieved around 450 participants are there we are indeed thankful for them for having a patient listening asking the question and getting little more aware about what is going to be the shape of uh, uh, the consultation whether it is in clinic street hospital or even telemedicine thank you so much sir thank we are you. thankful for your thank you jisan sir thank you so much welcome sir thank you all again and uh, thank you so much tomorrow is a eid also so have a safe and uh, wonderful celebration thank you sir thank you